Welcome to my channel. This is Socialist Links. In this video, we're going to t be talking about the F the Chinese Revolution, the entire history of China, and where China is today, as well as the fact on my uh, efforts and my statements and a correct Marxist line and a correct Marxist theory into talking about China and what we must do in the efforts of China's history. I urge you to subscribe to my channel, uh, possibly... Um, Hit a notification bell uh, once you subscribe to see if I upload any more videos, just in case you want to learn anything more, as well as the fact that to like my videos so that way these videos uh, where we can start spreading class and political consciousness into the working class can actually start being be able to spread, as well as the fact being able to talk a lot about intellectual accuracy and the actual reality of efforts and the actual um, truth on certain things. I would very much like if you were to I very much like if you were to get this channel to be more known out into the public. Thank you. So, let's talk about China. It's always good to start with the background real quick. So, let's give that background. After World War II, China was torn into yeah, civil war. Nationalists fought with communists. The communists led by Mao Zedong eventually won in 1949. And there they founded the People's Republic of China. And the nationalists fled to the island of Taiwan that is known as the Republic of China. This government is currently still considered as an artificial government, even by the United States, due to um, foreign ties to the Chinese Civil War and how that ended. So in China, there was a massive civil war um, Again, from the Communist Party of China against the Kuomintang in an effort to try and control China and to be able to substitute over a lot of workers and be able to substitute over efforts in that, including with other uh, actually crushings and devastations of workers move of workers movements within China at the time. Um, workers movements that were self-organized by the working class themselves. Um, and we're actually looking for an actual vanguard and not a substitutionist format like what the Communist Party of China tried to do into trying to quote unquote lead to the work workers for revolution. After the People's Republic of China was declared, Mao Zedong had strong ties with Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union after this point. For quite a few years, Mao Zedong would continue to run China and implement various economic policies and various cultural policies and social policies as well within China that would massively change a lot of the culture and also somewhat um, change uh, efforts of China into becoming an uh, underdeveloped um, feudalist um, country into then becoming a state capitalist uh, country that it is today. Today, in this video, I will discuss and I will provide my points and provide arguments onto my thesis into China and into my statements in China and what we can essentially even learn from today in China's history and into China's entire shifts and turns within its history, as well as what we can learn from today in China's politics today as well, and what the communist stance must be if we are to actually find a workers' movement and base and base ourselves in a, in the working class themselves for there to be change in our current state of affairs. First off, I want to sit. I want to give a statement onto, um, onto China into the reasons why uh, it was actually not socialist, nor was it a workers' state. It was a capitalist economy that was run by the state entirely, where the state acted as an abstract class, uh, where the state itself basically acted as a bourgeois rule to the workers themselves, rather than actually abolishing the commodity form and the commodity format of capitalism in which there would actually not be a capitalist class entirely. There wasn't really a physical class, but really the state itself as an instrument of class antagonisms acting as a ruling class. And here I'm going to give my reasons why. In 1950, Mao Zedong uh, and, the gov and the government of communist China had passed a reform law baking up estates and distributing land uh, to more of the peasantry in order to promote 
freer competition and freer formats of competition and commod and commodity production within the peasant population that was regulated from the state and which the state themselves would actually decide a lot of efforts for peasants where the peasants uh, were able to own their own formats and own their own businesses and own their own land and be able to sell that um, into the into the market uh, where the state had control over and the state regulated and the state had more efforts into um, seeing over rather than actually um, having it more freer and having it more um, just to the each company itself like what the United States did. However, this still performed the same function. Commodities were indeed produced and commodities were exchanged for money uh, that would basically be determined by the labor time that was performed for each commodity producing that. This gets important very later. In these small plots of land, there was farms that was essentially cl that was uh, privately owned um, by the peasants themselves, where private property was indeed a, was indeed a thing within China. Private property being property that is bought and sold in relation to account in relation to economics, as in production and distribution and consumption. The difference here is that the production goals were set by the state, very much like how the employer were to set production goals and production efforts uh, from them to their workers in order to fulfill a certain amount of expect expectations and ex and uh, formats in which they can distribute more commodities for them to in order to get more profit. They had quote unquote socialized industry within its within the but in reality the socialization was really privatization done from the state as in privatization, um, being a private form being a private format in which it would being a private um factory and private industry that was not controlled by the people nor was based on the actual use value of the industry itself on how it can benefit the people but rather the exchange value on how it produced entirely within it putting more factories under the state ownership in thus bait didn't really actually change the economy but really just put more power um uh, away from a physical bourgeois class into the state where the state just acted as that abstract class. Regardless, workers were employed to work into lands, and not only into lands, but with the development of production and the development of output and industrial output, there was greater gains uh, for heavy industry to actually be developed, in which a working class and the rise of the working class and the rise of the proletariat in China was, was instituted for then the proletariat to go through um, the extraction of surplus value, where they essentially would be, sell their labor power to the state through a labor service system that was done from the state themselves in order to meet certain quotas of the state to where they can actually be um, employed to do so. And so, so they that way they can be employed and produce commodities um, for China to then sell those commodities into the world market, such as the United States, the Soviet Union, uh, Australia, um, France, Germany, and various other countries. In fact, very minimal has actually China even traded with Warsaw Pact aligned powers. Majority of its history and majority of China's history, they have actually traded with NATO aligned countries more than actually Warsaw Pact countries, which even only shows that even according to the quote unquote tanky idea of what would be considered socialism or what be considered as the alignment for socialism, or at least that they try to give. And what I mean by tanky in this instance, I don't necessarily mean, let's say, a Stalinist, but maybe a Khrushchevite or a uh, DDR fan, I would call him, um, talking about in this uh, in this effort, um, this heavy industry and this entire heavy format for commodification of the economy has made a lot of actual efforts where the country uh, was was in massive commodification from the state ownership itself rather than actually abolishing the formats of the commodification. The commodification is very important here because it needs to be abolished in order for there to actually be a change of the economic system itself. Because it does it does not matter the economic system at all, but rather the economic activity. Like just because you replace one employer with then the state acting as an employer, that's still just a capitalist, due to the fact that there that there's still a settlement of layer power in order to then produce commodities. 
there is still a selling of those commodities, and then thus doing so, the surplus value that the worker then produces within the workplace is still then extracted and used in order for the capitalists, as in the state, to benefit from the labor of the worker. And is that, and then the worker is then paid um, a certain amount of value and a certain amount of actually of the amount of late total labor time that they perform into the workday in a minimal amount in where they can really not get that much um, yet yeah, they can't really get that much um, amount in the total amount of labor time that they did perform but rather have that really be limited and have that be extracted. Uh, entirely and more uh, profit actually going to the capitalist from the labor of the worker. Not only that, but then there is the massive generalization of the market format within China that was heavily reliant in the world market for then workers to then use a lot of the paychecks and use a lot of the wages that they were given to then go to the market and buy commodities from the quote-unquote state-instituted and distributive uh, administrations that China had which just basically acted as supermarkets within the United States as what we would call them, but with a different name and was not necessarily controlled by a private company, but was quote-unquote publicized and socialized from the state. Regardless, the state still acted as just that one supermarket and where the state was, again, acting as an abstract capitalist, an abstract bourgeois, the abstract class. Due to the fact that the class relations and the class powers really don't matter and doesn't really matter who is in control of the industry, but rather the industry and the economic activity itself. This is why the formats in which, it, in which China could be called socialism or even a worker state is disingenuous and is not accurate at all to the actual theories or to the actual efforts into trying to change society and to trying to actually make a format in which society can change and which we can actually get to socialism from the efforts of the worker's state in order for there to be a new change of the world at, as we know it. In fact, in doing so, with this massive commodification, there was an actually increasement of poverty, increasement of unavailability for the commodities that workers would indeed produce, and and workers being forced into large, uh, into rural projects and into rural and into factories, they really did not have any say over, but was essentially done so due to the coercion, uh, indirect and direct, from the state. In order for them to, in order for them to get any form of effort to where they can actually get the things that they desire and get the things that they need to survive. Thus, in this effort, it wasn't really socialism, it wasn't communism, nor was it a worker state. It was more of state capitalism by function, due to the generalized commodity production that was around that which it had to come from private property based on the economic based on the economic law of value thus they were thus they were thus in that format thus in that format this entirely was an, a capitalist economy that came off and came off from the growth of competition from china to countries like the United States, Australia, Korea, South Korea, Japan, and other nations in order to extract as much profit as possible not, uh, in the world market entirely due to the fact that economics is also based on the international scale. In fact, when the People's Republic of China was established, the United States had actually tried to talk with Mao Zedong and had actually tried to have Mao Zedong actually ally with the United States, seeing that they called themselves communists, yet were making a lot of economic efforts to where they were more of just representing and more of just copying a lot of the formats that the United States had, but just having that control into the state. And the United States knew that, and so they actually had tried to ally with that. The sort, again, the source would actually be provided below for you to go check it out yourself. In that, the United States was more than happy to try and actually ally with China in order to get shared profits, as well as the fact uh, grow with each other in order to beat out competition together, which only would benefit the countries even more. 
This did not happen, however, due to the fact that China, not seeing, wanting, uh, or even desiring a relationship with the United States, decided to actually have a relationship with its uh, competitor at the time, the Soviet Union. Thinking the reasons why the United States wanted to ally with Mao Zedong's China into today's reality where, where the U.S. is actually allied with China today. It provides a cheap labor. It gives better availability for investing and being invested and having a larger political agreement and having American companies be more on the scene of China's capitalist economy and be able to trade with China. Today, we have... Today... And even today, we have all of that, but this was even an effort that was even tried to be done under Mao Zedong entirely, but was not done with the United States, but was more done so with the Soviet Union until, well, there would be the soviet sino split. We'll actually get more onto the so so soviet sino split, or what I would call the split of Stalinism. Mao Zedong, in fact, would even have the state help and promote businesses being made, and if they weren't made, the state would just market themselves, basically the state in control of the mode of production, which actually created the generalization of private property in doing so that they can exchange commodities into the market and in the world market with other countries which too was done both by those national both nationally in China and the world market where the planned economy despite it being called a quote unquote planned economy really just acted again as an abstract market as well production rates and production formats would even be shift closer under the great leap forward where Mao Zedong um would and Mao Zedong and the Communist Party of China would implement formats in which peasants and workers would try to work um, certain amount of would try to produce a certain amount of commodities so that way they can actually be oversupplied with commodities so that so that way they can actually have a higher price and a higher expression of value over the commodities of their competitors the competitor in the pre so in the previous production process. Um, Stuff was still even supplied with their competitors. In Mao, uh, in this, Mao wanted a giant uh, advantage over their competitors. Thus, like the five-year plans under Stalin in Russia, there would be a set employment of workers from the state, having their labor power bought and sold, and working them set hours. In that, due to them not having access to the products they produced and being paid less than what they are worth overall, due to needing to maintain the property uh, itself that the workers would work on, um, about 20 million uh, had died during this period at the most. Not necessarily estimate in total or in reality, but at the most 20 million. The actual accurate estimate would maybe be 15 million to 10 million that actually died during this period of the Great Leap Forward, not due to what the conservatives would call a communist effort to destroy the working class, but in reality, actually a capitalist uh, economic system that had actually lacked access from the workers having access to their own commodities that they have. Very much like how if you are a worker producing uh, chairs in the United States, you don't really own that chair. The capitalist does because he bought your labor power to do so. So if you need that chair, you still don't get it and you still need to pay for it even though you produced the chair and even though you did produce the chair. It's like saying that a it's basically when the McDonald's employee can work and produce a Big Mac, but cannot get a Big Mac until he pays for the Big Mac to, um, so that way the capitalists can get profit from the workers that they employed. This doesn't happen all the time, though. I'm not saying that this is a modern and generalized format, but that is a typical thing that can happen and does indeed happen and with a lot of McDonald's employees, in fact. Um, and just uh, just an example, if that makes sense. This is all due, yeah, to the market exchange, private property, and bourgeois rule, and everyday use of money. However, even before the People's Republic of China was established... There was actually still quite a bit of problems with the Communist Party of China and how it actually led down to this road of state capitalism 
from substitutionist practices. Due to the suppression and killing of actual communists that opposed uh, Mao Zedong, such as Qin Da Su, uh, Hu Xi, and Peng uh, Zhaoxi, and Xin Yu Jin, alternatives were not really around, uh, and were not really around for workers to actually be able to be educated into actual Marxist theory and actually have an effort to um, realize the revisionism and realize the substitutionism of the Communist Party of China in order to avoid this road. Uh, and rather, having Mao Zedong being the sole proprietor of quote-unquote Marxism and quote-unquote Leninism that led workers being fed into a liberation theory that in reality would just replace one of their oppressors with another oppressor. Then the state capitalist notion and the state capitalist uh, Communist Party of China knew that. So the reputation of Mao increased because, like, because he was really the um, only quote-unquote true communist um, and man who industrialized China. So in a way they were coerced to agree with China and agree with the so and agree with Mao Zedong in a way. When in reality they actually had no powers to the to the actual efforts uh, of the Communist Party of China, and even when the five year plans happened, and when Great Leap Forward did happen, and when there was indeed a law reform for China where cap capitalism and state cap state capitalism specifically was in instituted within China, they did not really have any effort. In fact, when Xin Jin talked about state capitalism within Russia. He was purged and was uh, was forced to exile into the United States, where he wrote the book, um, like China at Crossroads, um, towards a pro like China at Crossroads to socialism, um, towards uh, a manifesto towards proletarian democracy in China by Chen Er Jin. It's a great book. So in that, workers were really coerced in order to basically and to agree that everything that was happening, all because of how underground they made Marxist intellectuals, which made it harder for them to spread class and political consciousness. Things even changed for China. After the death of Stalin, there was many ideological splits that took place. To put it as Marxists, such as Max Chapman, Hale Draper, Julius Jacobson, Ken Tarbach, Tony Cliff, Chris Harman, John Molyneux, and Ask Kalinikos would call it the split of Stalinism. The Stalinists in topic here would be Mao Zedong and Verhoja, Yosef Bronz Tito, and Nikita Khrushchev, and... and Nigale Sassou. Since we're talking about China, um, mostly, I'll start with Mao Zedong and Maoism. Maoism is a branch of Stalinism that actually had revisions to it for what would benefit the Communist Party of China at the time. New, quote-unquote, quote-unquote, new democracy of China at the time um, was the idea that the Vanguard Party... Um, needs a strong grip over the resolutions that it that is made and that a separation of China of uh, of China of the chairman oh. as the separation um, of the chairman and the central committee into the power of the chairman um, to decide, and more, that would leave to more power into the chairman to decide in act and resolutions, um, or, or not. This theory also says that if there were to be a member that does not follow the party line, it, uh, is in disagreement with the chairman, the chairman would have, would have to then, uh, ban the member to prevent bad theory from being conducted. This is a very, very substitutionist practice that does the opposite of what it is intended to do. It makes bad theory out of the suppression of opposition. Because of this practice, it left Mao Zedong to second guess, to 
to not second guess what he said or to think of any self-criticism to his praxis. Thus, he got a lot of Marxist concepts wrong. He failed to put the practice of having a self-emancipation of the proletariat in this formation how, how, of how policies were, were passed just gave more more power to one or few um, chairs of the entire party of the entire party not even where it would uh, be a central committee deciding the affairs of the party from an unelected central committee the kind adopted into the second international and into the third international under stalin and how imagio borga's theory of organic centralism that uh that was and is adopted in the international communist party this power dynamic within the, within the supposed party of the proletariat defeats the entire function of what the party of the proletariat is supposed to be. The point of the vanguard isn't that the leadership leads the worker over them in their own class and political interests, rather that the workers themselves make their resolutions and, and the elected leaders take, make them. Those elected leaders having to be elected with a majority vote of Soviets in branches electing policies and leaders with a recallable votes and elections if resolutions are not able to satisfy uh, to suffice or the leaders uh, are disconnected from the proletariat and are unable to do their job as they are elected for. Here, the proletariat themselves are in power for their political organizing, for revolution. This is what Vladimir Lenin talked about in his theories of democratic centralism. To Lenin and Trotsky, and to, and to Marx and Engels, the point of the revolution is that it has to be made from the proletariat themselves. This doesn't then mean that we shouldn't use the vanguard. We still want a successful revolution, for crying out loud. What we want, however, is not this quote-unquote vanguard to substitute over the proletariat or even the peasantry, or even the peasantry. It wouldn't even be a vanguard at that point. It would just be a sect. A sect is that is no better than a union acting as a revolutionary organization. Like a union or like a, like a union, the or... The org wouldn't be made up of the workers, thus not able to take the full leap uh, for revolution and would rather make decisions to what would sustain the org and not the, um, and not the acts that would promote workers' revolution and sustain and create one. When it does by function substitute over the proletariat, this isn't a vanguardism. That's just a powerful sect. Talk uh, now. Let's talk about Hoja. Enver Hoja was more of a person that essentially tried to stay with Stalin's entire policies uh, when it came to the split of Stalinism, uh, where he was more of a person to promote strong borders um, within Albania, acts of against revisionism and against efforts to criticize Stalin and to criticize the works of Stalin himself and the works that Stalin had made where there would be actually where there would be actually a massive uh, repression and massive control of the central committee of the party over the people and the general membership of the party over the working class to lead the workers for to have the work to have the party make the revolution for the working class rather than the workers actually having a revolution themselves but really the party just making efforts of political violence and claiming it to be a mass revolution in order to make resolutions over the workers um and to lead the workers of rev into revolution as well as the fact of decisions and resolutions not being made from Soviets, but being made from predetermined and pre uh elections in order to sustain the efforts and to sustain the mobility and the, and the efficiency um, of the socialist republic, quote-unquote socialist republic, so to, in order to benefit, um, in order to benefit the the state um, where 
efforts and change can be made for quote unquote emancipation. This entire problem is the same problem that we pointed out with Mao Zedong. It's very substitutionist and it does not actually help any efforts to making some form of effort where revolution can actually be made from the working class themselves. Uh, and it actually would create bad theory due to the suppression of opposition and the suppression of act of opposition from workers in order to create a coherent and massive um, fluent theory for there to actually be revolutionary um, efforts and revolutionary action and effective revolutionary action at that in a revolutionary situation. Instead, this revolutionary situation would be abused in order to create a substitution political violent act over the proletariat themselves. And would rather be more of an effort to sustain and profit and benefit the given political organization that would basically act as a sect, not a vanguard, um to make efforts into revolutionary action over workers. Oh, and to... I forgot to mention about Mao Zedong's other theories. Um, Mao Zedong's other theories also came into mass line, which is the same... which is kind of the same of new democracy. It was more of a way for the proletariat to act... and the peasantry to act as an advisory role to the party in which party leaders uh, would try to listen to peasants and try to listen to workers uh, in which they can actually be governed in a way and actually have a coherent effort and a coherent uh, quote-unquote theory in which they can actually take their actions ahead but this is a problem still because it's not the workers themselves joining within the communist party itself nor is there an actual way where these resolutions that workers are actually proposing can indeed be passed and is still an entire effort for the chairman of the communist party to just ignore the workers and to just do what and just can actually perform actions and what can benefit them at that moment and to try and say that this action that would benefit them could also try to benefit the workers but in reality is not taking the full leap into actually talking with the working class and actually being directed from the workers themselves and actually having an effort for workers themselves to actually create that format um, for revolutionary activity and thus basically creating a format where workers just acting as an advisory role um, can either get ignored and can be um, and cannot necessarily have an actual say into the system and when they and even though the entire point of Marxist theory and Landis theory and the entire point of revolution is that it is created from the people themselves and is created from themselves so where to where they can have an effort for uh, a revolutionary action and the overthrow of society as a whole and for there to be a change of of the current establishment uh, current established world system and to a change for a new world system uh, away from capitalism and into socialism, away from capitalist society into a socialist society. One other major problem I have with Maoism as well is the theory of third worldism. Although this is not really a emphasized argument uh, from Mao Zedong and even Mao is actually disagreeing with some of Mao's ideas in this um, and not necessarily taking a third worldist position in some cases, Third worldism is still the idea that a re that the revolution in the and the working class in the quote unquote first world, as in the developed nations such as the United States, Canada, Mexico, are not necessarily as revolutionary as they can be, and thus, um, and, and thus, um, it's either not as revolutionary as it can be, or they're not exploited as much as the working class within uh, the third world nations. Third world nations being countries like Vietnam, let's say Cambodia, Laos, Iraq, Saudi, not Saudi Arabia, Syria, Syria um, Oman, Yemen, countries like that, um, to where they are actually more revolutionary than workers within the first world due to the fact that they are exploited a lot heavier more than workers within the first world. Although... In, in a way, it is true that workers within the third world are indeed exploited more, and thus it would indeed, in that logic according to Mao Zedong, would thus be easier to actually have a revolution within the third world first, uh, in which 
then revolution can spread onto the first world um that after when the third world is able to develop further this is still problematic due to the fact of the third world being a third world nation quote unquote is a third world nation due to the fact that it does not have enough economic power nor does it have enough economic power or economic mobility or economic determination to where they can have effective say into the economic system that we face into today's standards of capitalism. The problem, in fact, on why they are so exploited and why they're so overly exploited, as Michael Parenti would even call it, is the fact that they that their entire country has been has had a cheaper labor force has been massively abused and has been in a way where their workplace and their entire uh, economy is really just is really subjugated and determined and um dependent on other nations and other factors to where if a workers revolution were to take place into third world nations like what has happened in the past these nations and these revolutions would be easily deflected. Welcome to the theory of deflected permanent revolution that Tony Clifford made in response away against third worldism. This entire revolution that would be made into third world nations due to the fact of not having enough economic power nor economic say within the world market of capitalist economics, they really can't actually make an entire effort or make actually a sustainable change to where they can actually effectively change society as thus resulted to either being encircled by capitalist nations um, in order to either either concede to the capitalist system to where they go through the exact same exploitation as they faced before and thus lose everything that they fought for or that they fight until their last breath to where the revolution and what remained of that could die or that until the country just invades into the nation and in, into the already established workers' state and this crushes it down, or where the revolution itself is, does not even become an official workers' state, but rather just degenerates the state capitalism almost immediately. This is, this is indeed what's happened many, many, many times within quote-unquote socialist nations within Africa and in the Middle East, in Central Asia and Southeast Asia and various others. This is the prop then third worldism being tried has usually just resulted in these nations further degenerating. This only just shows that actually if we are to actually see in that effort and see that problem in that entire standard of what we consider as a effort for a successful revolution and a more efficient way to change society it would actually be the exact opposite. We would not need a revolution in the third world first, but rather in the first world first. Not necessarily saying that the first world is just more better than the third world, no, but that just simply put that they have more economic power and that they have a higher trading mobility and that they are the country that these nations are so heavily dependent to and that these nations are so heavily exploited to to where that these nations, as in the first world, as in the United States, Canada, and other nations, Norway, Denmark, Germany, France, etc., the first world, they are the countries that actually have more of that power and actually more economic power to where if there were to be a revolution there, and if revolution were indeed hit there, that would be a massive hit in the entire economic format of capitalism. If a revolution were to hit in the United States, the world would have just lost the biggest trading partner in the fucking world into a workers' revolution where now exchanging commodities is considered a counter-revolutionary, is now considered as a counter-revolutionary crime and would result into the apprehension of the proletarian militia into the sustainability of the rule of the majority of the people themselves. And that would increase even further an insp uh, in inspiration and entire efforts for international revolution for them to take place within the first world. For then, for then those first world nations having that enough economic power, having that enough industry, having enough those resources that has been extracted from the third world can actually then bring those extracted resources back to the third world and actually help efforts into where revolutions can indeed take place in the third world. Thus, in a reality format, when a revolution can take place in the first world first, it's actually an effort where 
both the third world and the first world can benefit in a workers revolution and effort for the workers themselves to actually create a format where there can actually be an effort for change and be an effort for there to be economic formats. This is the entire thing of why I would say revolution within the first world is actually more needed than revolution in the third world. Um, because the result and the history of third worldism being put into practice has resulted into the deflection of workers' revolutions and not necessarily the actual sustainability of those workers' revolutions. And now to Hoxha, back again to Hoxha. Um, with Hoxha's theories also in relate to Stalinism, Hoxha's entire theories today uh, is more a result into a lot of these statements and a lot of the... A lot of the statements and a lot of the uh, economic mobilities and economic formations in which the state would have a massive control into the economy itself and would have a ma and would have either full control of the economy or most control of the economy where the state would just act as a ruling body and act as a ruling format for the for um, the commodity form economy itself saying that this would be a true way to socialism. As we just said, though, it does not necessarily matter on who is in power of the economic system, but rather the economic activity itself. If the economic activity itself is the same as any other capitalist nation, but not necessarily the power dynamics, then that doesn't really matter because the same, because the functions and the entire resolutions of the economic system is still around and still poses deep-rooted problems that basically is just a go back to the entire purpose of what the workers were trying to fight against or supposedly trying to fight against in the first place. In this, there shouldn't be an effort for just state control, but rather state control from a worker's state, a smash state machine, with then the smashing of the state machine, machine resulting in the smashing up of the economy as well, whereas there's the dismantling of the capitalist economic activity and for the ongoing establishing of a socialist economic activity. Not necessarily socialism being established, however, due to the fact of classes being impossible to be abolished at that point. Um, and same with money and the state as well, all three still being needed and still actually being there in order to ha in order to have the revolution in order to basically get to the system get to the new system entirely in the first place because because social because you cannot get the socialism at one stroke, however, that does not mean that get not getting the socialism at one stroke doesn't then mean that you can't necessarily have a fast-paced motion in which you can change the actual economic formations to where there is an actual change in an actual format in which there would be economic in, in a change of economic formations and not necessarily just the state in control of production. To talk about Khrushchev, Khrushchev and his entire theories was a bit more different than, was a lot different than Stalin and Hoxha um, and Mao Zedong as well. With Khrushchev, he was more of the effort into de-Stalinization with appreciation to Joseph Stalin in where there would actually be more of an opening of markets and more of the private sector have and like a literal company and and private and more private businesses having more of an effort into the capitalist economics uh, within Russia itself and in other nations as well rather than the state having a massive control into the economy or having full control into the economy where it just acts as an abstract capitalist, but rather an effort where a physical capitalist class can indeed surpass the state itself and where the capitalist class can have that. This problem of Khrushchevism is basically just the same problem of capitalism in general. It's a rule of the minority over the majority. It's massively exploitive, massively alienating, inhumane, and absolutely terrible for the actual lives and for the actual people themselves. As well as the fact Khrushchev was massively um, imprudent to where production goals and production quotas would would mainly be set into private companies themselves and private firms themselves and having less effort into the state itself. Basically it was basically Khrushchev was more for the liberalization of the Stalin of the Stalinist um 
formats of the economy that Stalin had implemented within Russia and that Hoxha had defended and that Mao Zedong had copied uh, somewhat within China. Next was Yosef Brahms Tito. With Tito, um, he indeed still had a capitalist economy within Yugoslavia. However, in this effort, what made Josip Brahms Tito different was that his emphasis on partisan effort and partisan support and partisan formats for revolution. While I may agree on a anti-fascist united front, which is what I would claim partisans in World War II were indeed an example of, I will not say that then the partisans in general are indeed efforts for revolution. There, is, are, there are many more efforts and there are many more organizational efforts to where revolution can be carried out from the working class themselves. Anti-fascism is indeed an effort where the workers themselves can indeed make an effort to that. But the whole point of anti-fascism, the whole point of that quote-unquote partisan that Josip Brahms Tito would call is the fact that it promotes actually a format where workers can gain class and political consciousness in order to create the vanguard from the work of anti-fascism in the first place. And thus, where the Anti-Fascist United Front, although as a revolutionary organ, is a very temporary format when fascism is a threat and when fascism is no longer a threat, the partisans cannot just merely take over, but rather the United Front entirely is then can actually then transfer into actually the side of the communists once the communists are actually able to influence the working class when fighting against fascism at the same time. So in that, it's very critical um, remarks to Tito. But also with Tito as well and his economic formations, um, he... Uh, he made formations of a capitalist economy and a workers' cooperatives and emphasized on that and emphasized on workers' cooperatives um, being a heavily and a heavy thing within Yugoslavia with then the state, with really more of the state acting as how unions would be with, uh, with cooperative society that syndicalists would advocate for, uh, where the state would have more of an effort into worker cooperatives and into factory committees being established within... Uh, within the state and not necessarily with active unions, but rather the fact that worker cooperatives were formatted um, into where workers uh, would sell their labor power to the entire workplace and would be paid wages um, by the entire workplace rather than one person. This is still the exact same capitalist economy and still the exact same capitalist format, but the difference really being onto, into just the workers themselves then, or workers in cooperatives, would then collectively organize and collectively um, strategize onto the actual planning of the extraction of surplus value of the worker, and not necessarily the abolition of the extra uh, extraction of surplus value entirely, or what I would call, yeah, or yeah, it's basically just making exploitation more democratic than really abolishing exploitation. Workers are still having to sell their layer power. They're still having to get paid um they're still having to get paid minimal amounts of what they're act of what they actually performed into the workday. Um their labor benefits um the entire business in which the business is able to profit out of from their labor they are still fetishizing two commodities in which their entire uh, relationships and their entire uh, ways of life is more fixated to money and to commodities themselves rather than humanity and themselves and other people, as well as the fact that this is still alienating their own control from their own labor and alienating their own self-worth into their own labor, but rather seeing work and seeing labor as actually a disingenuous thing and actually seeing something that is very much uh, annoying and is a nuisance towards themselves, even despite the fact that these same people would then desire to want to be something in society, but then see work as an annoying and nuisant and nuisanted thing, uh, which creates an entire alienated format to themselves and to their own ability to labor, which only makes their societal life even worse. The only difference is that this alienation, this exploitation, this commodity fetishism, this 
this inhumane format of how to treat economics and this inhumane format, inhumane format for people is just more democratic than rather bureaucratically owned by one person or by a few. Either way, the workers' cooperative, like the state, is just acting as an abstract bourgeois to where the workers just exploit themselves. And there's Sasu. No one really takes him seriously. Um, Sasu, he was basically just Stalin. He was basically just Stalin. He was basically just a Stalinist that emphasized heavily onto a nation state of Romania and heavily esti- and heavily um, estimated into closed borders and heavily estimated into um, into more of a Romanian uh, socialist way rather than actually um, creating a format in which. Um, in which it wouldn't necessarily care about nationalities, but actually be more of an effort for globalization and, uh, and for international trade, but rather having trade mostly be limited to foreign na- to close neighbors and rather than actually participating more into the world market to where they were still participating to the world market, but not on the massive scale as Yugoslavia, as the Soviet Union, as DDR, as Albania, as China, and as Vietnam did uh, within their state capitalist nations. After the failures of the Great Leap Forward and after the uh, formats in which the Great Leap Forward had actually resulted into deaths of of millions of people within China, um, there was... China and Mao Zedong's efforts and relations within China uh, and his reputation uh, decreased further and decreased heavily down in China where where Mao's entire image suffered uh, very much in China as well and was actually mounting criticism from from people like Qin Yu Jin um, as as we all know today that was that was setting these policies and even other people and just general workers within China that was criticizing um, Mao Zedong and the Great Leap Forward to where um, to where the capitalist formats of China had resulted into the death of, of millions and thousands um, due to the commodification, massive commodification of the economy itself. And the generalization of commodity production, the formation of private property within China that allowed there to really be that entire format um, within China. Mao Zedong launched a effort and made an economic reform and investments and as well as social policy as well that would be and that would actually make formats in which state enterprises would actually shut down and there would actually be um, more of a privatization of the economy despite the fact that the same privatization from the state is exactly what resulted into this problem. Um, and really privatization mostly been promoting from business and and capitalist formats. He then, and in doing so, he claimed that then um, China had lost, uh, the Communist Party had then lost touch with the people. In, so in 1966, Mao called on students to revive, quote-unquote, China's revolutionary spirit, where uh, students that were pro-Mao Zedong and that were pro-China, uh, uh, known as Red Guards, took to the streets demanding a return, demanding um really a support for Mao Zedong and a support for and a support for for Mao's theories entirely due to the fact again of the suppression of opposition within China uh, and the suppression of mass of uh, of opposition where the actual communist theories could actually be implemented and thus China was basically soon engulfed in a wave of basically turmoil that was conducted from the Communist Party themselves, known as the Cultural Revolution. And with Mao's blessing and Mao's, um, like, contributions, the Red Guards uh, attacked anyone that they considered anti-revolutionary and counter-revolutionary, and targets include and targets of included um included party members, 
uh, pop government officials, artists, intellectuals, and others who said to embrace quote-unquote old ideas, as in the old traditionalist values of Kuomintang, but also people that didn't even hold those traditionalist values, but also hold the Marxist values that, that they criticized Mao Zedong for. One of the most prominent of these intellectuals that I have mentioned beforehand was Chin Ir Jin, who criticized Mao Zedong criticized the capitalist economy of China and said that it was state capitalists being forced into exile into in, into the United States where he would write the book, where he would write a manifesto for proletarian democracy in China or known as China Crossroads of Socialism. And there would be blood on the streets and there was mass and there was actually street fighting as well in a lot of areas. There was beaten people and then and they were jailed. Uh, and they were imprisoned from the standing army and the police force that was instituted within China during this time. That's also another thing about China. They and why it was not a worker state. They had failed to actually smash the state machine. They still had the police force and they still had the standing army in place. With the whole point of the worker state having to actually abolish the standing army and abolish the police force as well. With this turmoil actually increasing and with the amount of violence increasing, Mao Zedong uh, called for um, a disbanding of Red Guards at the moment in 1968. And thus in, and thus in 1968, Red Guards are disbanded. Um, and the most, one of the most extreme phases of the Cultural Revolution was over and with the following year. However, there would be political struggles and continued until Mao's death in, in 1976. And new and a new leaders and new purges too within China would result in happening um, for a struggle of power within China, very much like how in the death of Stalin, with the death of Stalin, there would be struggles of power as well. One of the most prominent figures that came about in this struggle for power was Deng Xiaoping. Also, before we move on to Deng Xiaoping, <clears throat> I want to mention that uh, Mao Zedong was very much prominent into actually gaining a lot of international influence into the world. In doing so, where he'd actually ally with various other figures. He even tried to basically have massive talks with Richard Nixon in which China would actually have direct industry within to the United States and the United States would try to do the same. Richard Nixon then declined on that. But however, in two, having international relations and having an effort to have further international influence, Mao Zedong would actually ally with Augusto Pinochet, the same Chilean dictator that would, that overthrew Salvador Allende, a democratic socialist that was that was elected within Chile um, to promote to actually create efforts for um, a changing of economic systems. Uh, in a via coup supported by the United States, and this was another thing that China had done, and this is a thing that Mao Zedong had done, which is absolutely counter-revolutionary, and is literally just Mao Zedong supporting a guy that even came about from the slogan of anti-communism. Now let's talk about Deng Xiaoping. With Deng Xiaoping, he implemented market reforms in where. Um, more private businesses and more efforts of private businesses and international efforts would be implemented within China to where they would have actually more of an open economy uh, of the market rather than actually having more of trade being limited or trade um, being more um, state sanctioned, but rather actually letting the state actually have less influence within to China but rather having private businesses uh, be effortized and be instituted by, by uh, like within China itself in order to actually have more of a relation and more trade with the with countries themselves and private businesses with other private businesses and the bourgeois states rather than via one bourgeois state and private business um, entirely, but rather uh, the bourgeois state against another, for another bourgeois state and the bourgeois company from the bourgeois company to a bourgeois state to another bourgeois company, if that makes sense. It's a bit weird in a way, and it's a bit weird putting it that way. That's the best way I can put it. Um, but it was basically into Nikita Khrushchev's economic reforms of de-Stalinization, um, and then being adapted from Deng Xiaoping and what he did there. 
there was more of a bit of an emphasis on workers' cooperatives being established within China, but this was actually then disbanded within the eight uh, in the nineties um, due to due to uh, mismanagement and due to actually workers rebelling against the Chinese government um, as well. We might know it as the Tiananmen Square massacre and the student revolt there that actually rebelled due to actually some formats of capitalist economics like through workers' cooperatives that was instituted within China. This is usually not broadcasted within China, though, due to, well, obvious reasons to try and sustain its own power, even against the rights of its own people, which is a problem. Um, and that was the thing about Deng Xiaoping. What Deng Xiaoping did, he didn't really institute capitalism at all, despite a lot of the Maoist claims. Nor is he trying to. Nor did he create a system for socialism with Chinese characteristics, in which we could actually get to socialism. Rather, what he did is that he opened up the economy even further to where private businesses could actually emerge further than what it did under Mao Zedong and where private businesses were still even able to actually be established under Mao Zedong after the Great Leap Forward, <laughs> um, which is one of the reasons why the Cultural Revolution happened for there to be more state control and for there to be a reason for more of an effort um, a further state control uh, and for an effort for China and the Communist Party to regain its image, quote unquote, and regain its control, regain its image. And with that in mind, they had more efforts into actually having international alliance, having international trade with bourgeois companies. Uh, more and more American companies were able to be established and the United States were now able to directly invest into businesses uh, within China, not just the United States, but also various other countries were able to now directly invest into industry within China to where and actually directly have companies go into China to where they can adopt cheaper labor, they can adopt a cheaper force, they can actually have political agreement with people in China, and so that way they can actually benefit themselves economically, politically, and, and, uh, geopolitically, and geopolitically as well. With the death of Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping then expanded on this uh, even further with what we know today as the Belt Road Initiative. This was possibly this is possibly what I would call um, how China turned from state capitalism to then becoming imperialist. With the Belt Road Initiative and what it's doing uh, today, in fact, um, is that it buys out a lot of ports and it buys out uh, a lot of efforts and a lot of um, formations within other nations um, to where they can finance capital, they can finance workers uh, in their own in their own industry itself, uh, in order to basically for the capitalists and for the capitalists as investing from banks from China from Chinese banks into investing into companies and investing into workplaces to actually gain more of a profit from the owner of then this uh, of these companies that would actually be then Chinese dominated due to the investment of of these workplaces um, and as well as the banks. Uh, where they can actually, where they can actually uh, have shared profits even further from the financiation of capital, creating the accumulation of labor into a special force of workers producing labor and producing certain commodities to where they can actually um, have a higher price of labor power um, once they're already employed. That would actually have them. Ha produce a higher surplus value into each into the labor power that they would perform and the labor time that they perform into the workday, so that way the capitalist and uh, and the bank could actually have higher sh could have higher profits and could even share those profits among with each other to benefit the to benefit themselves and benefit the industry and benefit the commodification entirely over the labor and over the basically further financiation and exploitation of workers. Uh, with another nations into benefiting another state uh, outside of them. That is what's happening in Sri Lanka, that's what happened in Oman, that's what happened in Ethiopia, and that's what happened in Somalia. What this has done is that this has actually increased poverty within these nations even further, very much like how the United States getting involved and in doing the exact same thing within countries like Iraq, Syria, um, Lebanon, um, 
UAE, Saudi Arabia has actually increased poverty and increased and increased um, devastation and economic and and de- and decrease economic mobility for people within within these firms that the United that the United States would control and U.S. banks would control as well within their permanent arms war economy to then keep that. So to conclude, despite the fact on how in this basically video we've been railing on China, we've been railing on Maoism, we've been railing on Stalinism, this entire video. But what can we actually learn from this video here in the conclusion? Well. The conclusion here um, is that in China's failures, in China's history of substitutionism, in its formats in where it was ma- massively devastated from capitalist economics and was substituted by the Communist Party of China, what we can conclude is actually that we need to learn from China's failures and in order to actually be able to move into an actual effort where we can actually have a self-emancipation of the proletariat. A lot of what we can conclude here is that the self-emancipation of the proletariat is necessary in order for there to be societal change. Not only that, but that we have to take a lot of the formats of China today and we do indeed have to criticize them. China is not our, is not our friend. They have never been our friend. And they have actually, and they have actually created formats in which almost every communist and every socialist should indeed criticize and not take into in any inspiration at all, or take any format of takeaways within China. And the only takeaways that you can take away from China is this crit is possibly their critics and to their analyses that is actually critical of Mao Zedong and critical of the Communist Party of China. That's one of the best ways you can actually take China in that. To where you cannot see China, or you cannot see Mao Zedong, you cannot see in Verhoja, and or nor any capitalist state at all that has happened as an inspiration, but rather as not as as really a failure um, for there to actually be a workers' revolution. When the workers' revolution that was actually even established within within 1927 in the Shanghai Commune and the Canton Commune were crushed. In the po- during the Civil War in a popular front with the Kuomintang between the Communist Party of China and the Kuomintang, to where the actual efforts for there to be a self-emancipation of the proletariat, where the Communist Party could actually be a vanguard party, was essentially ignored and was not actually was actually not acted on, where the workers essentially then get where the workers then died from 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 the popular front that the Communist Party even then directly helped for Chiang Kai-shek to crush. This is why China and a lot of its efforts and even the history of Maoism and what so far has come about within Maoism has really just resulted into failures and into massive amounts of of terrors. And that one thing I would actually say that what we have to do now in the socialist movement today is return back to Karl Marx himself. We have to realize there has to be a self-emancipation of the proletariat. We have to realize that the proletariat's liberation comes from the workers themselves. We have to realize that the worker state in its effort has to actually abolish commodity production and not just have commodity production be controlled from the state. And we have to go back to Lenin and actually, and not not even go at to Len, but go, but still stay in Marx, and have to realize that the party of the proletariat entirely does not lead the workers over the revolution, but rather educates workers and its leadership being elected leaders to where the leaders can actually help other workers as the leaders are workers themselves, educating other workers for revolutionary activity, where the workers can actually make a revolution to actually change it. And where there can be direct democracy, there can be democratic formations within this format to where there can actually be a dictatorship and or absolute rule of the ruling class rather than a literal party dictatorship over workers. But rather the party dictatorship, that's really not even a party dictatorship, a proletarian dictatorship, but the party dictatorship and the party being a massive workers party and the party being made up of the workers themselves. This is what we have to understand into China. What we have to understand in China, what we have to understand with China entirely is a lot of its mistakes is due to the failures of not actually returning back to what Karl Marx himself had talked about and what Karl Marx himself had said into its Marxist theory, but rather as a reversion 
uh, away from Marx, away from Engels, and away from Lenin, and really just a dot, and really just a appreciation for the quote unquote Marxism that Joseph Stalin had implemented, which was in of itself a reversion away from Marx, Engels, and Lenin. That's what the neo Trotskyist position tries to say. That's what we try to do. We try to actually have a format in which we can actually look to Marx himself and actually look to quote-unquote classical Marxism and Marxism Marxism rather than the quote-unquote Marxism that other quote-unquote Marxists had and rather actually look to Marxism Marxism into where we can actually have efforts for there to be a genuine revolution and a genuine effort to change society. That is a conclusion that we can have with China, and that's one thing that we need to understand today, and that we need to stand against China, and if there were to be an effort for a workers' revolution against China, I will be massively in support, actually, against the Chinese state to today. The Chinese state today is a state capitalist hellhole, that, and it always has been, that is now ma making efforts into going into imperialism. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, hit the like button down below. I'd very much appreciate it. Um, if you're new to my channel, please subscribe to my channel um, and get this uh, bigger following. Um, being able to get likes, being able to be subscribed on would help this channel from further into actually spreading revolutionary theory and actually creating intellectual honesty and actually creating uh, accurate videos to where we can actually have political debates and political discussion and be educated on various formats and various concepts in the world in which we can actually uh, make efforts into possibly getting these ideas more more known and actually being able to actually change something within the world spreading class and political consciousness and getting people smarter thank you for watching this video um and click on the videos on the right um to watch even more of my stuff and yeah um as well as the fact that once you subscribe you can hit the notification bell into where you can watch more of my videos when i upload uh further in fact, uh, I'm thinking of actually, make, I'm going to do a video, uh, another video on Israel and the current politics between the Palestinian-Israeli conflict um, in order to expand more onto what should happen within Israel and the current situation today, as well as the fact I'm actually going to try and make a video on the Saigon Commune and um, my critical, my problems with Ho Chi Minh um, and the Communist Party of Vietnam. Uh, and what and its involvement within the Saigon Commune. Uh, I would say Ho Chi Minh being the butcher of the Saigon Commune. Anyways, more on that in the next and more on that in more videos. Um, thank you for watching this video and uh, yeah, have a good one. See y'all.